Um, when he came to England in 1603, he brought these ideas very forcefully with him, and, and eventually in 1611 they were uh, they, they had a massive effect on on the new translation of the Bible, and it was King James's Bible. It wasn't God's really. Um, uh, so. Did that the fact that he was on the throne of England as well as Scotland and Wales, uh, that obviously gave him a position of much greater power. And so we have a thinker, a serious thinker, on the throne in a, in a place of real power, which had taken a big stand against the alternative of the Pope. And that changed, as it were, if I can use this trite phrase, it changed the game in Europe, didn't it? With with James being so powerful in powerful position there. Well, I think the dynamics of debate are slightly different in Scotland. His big en- his most prominent intellectual enemies have been the Presbyterian Church who advanced a theocratic theory of kingship. Um, in England there are the Puritans, that are out there, they're the hotter sorts of Protestants, but they're not advancing the same kind of pretensions uh, with the same amount of weight behind them as James had experienced in Scotland. James begins to turn his weight to the traditional enemies for the divine right monarchs, the claims of the papacy. He's very quickly met by the gunpowder plot. He then um, imposes an oath of allegiance over all of um, his subjects. And I think historians are still divided about whether or not the divine right theory that James is proposing is primarily just a theory of um, obligation. It's negatively advanced against the papacy, or whether it's actually something more positive, whether it's actually a theory of sovereignty that then claims for him all sorts of absolutist powers. Was he being, as I understand it, to Justin Chapman, he was being supported by other thinkers at the time. There's the Dutch Protestant living in London called Hadrian A. Saravia. Mm-hmm. I hope that's how I pronounce it. And he, he wrote about the divine right of kings also. Could you briefly tell us uh, what he uh, said? Absolutely. I th- Saravia, a you know, man who moved from Le- Leiden to Lambeth um, in the course of his, his career, is, is emblematic in one sense of the intertwined politics between religion um, and and secular politics. You know, Saravia is, is a churchman. He's hostile to all of the Protestant theories of resistance that Claire has talked about and wants to authorise divine authority within the, the, the British state. And, and one of the things we can see from his writings is that th- this, this theory... Uh, I think we should probably talk about an instinct rather than a theory, is, is incredibly bibliocentric. Uh, you know, Romans 13, obey the powers that be, various statements in Proverbs, you know, you shall obey God, my son, and the king. Um, the, the, the white noise, if you like, of political discourse comes from scripture. And what um, theorists like Saravia and others are trying to do is, is make a connection between the way people live their lives, their religious expectations and convictions and beliefs, and the way political authority is constructed. So the, 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 the strands that go in to create this ideology are, are not simply propositional and theoretical. They, they are social. They're, they're um, much more part of the routine lives of, of everyday people. How is this being briefed? How is this being re- I'm going to say briefly again. How how is this being received, Justin? It, it is, this a, is this an, an argument among a very few people, or is this this is going through the bishops? Is it going through the priests? Is it going to the country? Is the country saying yes? I, I think, especially after the accession of James I and the the threat of the gunpowder plot, which be, becomes a great set piece for authorizing allegiance and, and oaths of obligation, we, we can gunpowder see gunpowder plot sounds rather rather charming and bonfire night. It was a huge terrorist attack. It was which a huge blew up plot, and, Holland, it, and yes. it gave a massive platform for for huge production of all sorts of, of political literature from great set pieces to tiny little pamphlets and more importantly sermons you know, ev- every week, every Sunday mm. more often if you were a hot Protestant you would get these sorts of languages preached and believed so I, I, I think we've always got to recognise that the div- divine right theory of monarchy or of kingship is, is a basic instinct for a lot of the community. Certainly on the continent, Roman Catholic theorists from Suarez through to Bellamine are incredibly hostile. And one of the counterintuitive things about this period is, of course, that it's those thinkers who are much more radical in their constitutionalism, talk about the community and consent creating authority. So we have you know, good modern Roman Catholics defending the papacy and old-fashioned English Protestants defending an, an institution of monarchy. So it's, it's a very odd period. Uh, Tom Healy, it, it, it comes into drama, spectacularly, as it were, Christopher Marlowe, Edward II, the first time an English king has been killed on stage, mm-hmm. and then we have Shakespeare, Richard II. Out of those two, can you draw us a few conclusions as to what uh, those two Blairites and, and the literary scene at that time was saying about the divine right, how he took it on and, and how it, what he did with it? Well, in both respects, 
at one level, they question uh, when it becomes legitimate to overthrow a monarch and indeed whether a monarch can or should be overthrown. Both plays deal with kings who are presented, at least in the early part of the play to the audience, as giving in to excessive appetite, particularly Edward II. He's made out to be too uh, much under the control of his lover Gaveston, that uh, the relation being homosexual itself causes disquiet amongst his, uh, his barons. And similarly, in Richard II, uh, 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 Richard is presented as a weak and often seen as an effeminate king, a, f a, a figure who is incapable of, of, of ruling authoritatively, and again, who exceeds his apparent mandate. But what both plays also do as they progress is to have an audience come back to start questioning this. Is the view of these figures as really excessive, uh, just uh, borne out by what happens throughout the play? Do they actually, is it not a matter that we see those who oppose them actually creating a, a view of them in this way and that their authority is more absolute or God-given and unquestioned. And particularly in Richard II, there is a, a, a very, very serious issue that arises because Richard, in effect, tries to depose himself. I mean, he's forced to by Bolingbroke. Um, and, but, but technically, he resigns the crown. He's not actually forced off, off the throne. But then in a very long uh, speech and scene, he really questions whether this can actually be done, whether he, given that his authority comes from God, whether he can actually give up the crown, whether there isn't something that is invested him, in him directly. And the play, I think, ultimately suggests that there is a, a, a sense, a wide acceptance within the public that authority does ultimately emerge from God Itself, that there is a view that this action in deposing Richard is going to have a very unfortunate legacy. It will lead to the Hundred Years' War. Now, the, the other issue becomes back of whether this is actually coming from God, that God himself is uh, chastising the nation for whatever sinful, unhealthy practices it may be engaging with, and therefore, ultimately, all of this stems from God rather than from man. It is ambiguous, and you've expressed that very well. Can we just take it a little bit further, Cla Cla Jackson? With, with Macbeth, we have regicide in Macbeth, and we have the, the idea closer that the killing of a king <coughs> leads to, well, what it led to in, in Macbeth. And in, in Hamlet, Hamlet, one of the reasons we are given to understand that Hamlet is, is prevented from or doesn't k kill... Claudius is just Claudius is a king, and this will not only be a murder; it'll be it'll be a, an offence against God, and, and, and so on. So it's it, it's something that the playwrights are, are, are battened onto. Do you think they battened onto it because it's such a good idea, <laughs> or because <laughs> they because the, it is, they have this is what they see as the well to take up Justin's word, the feeling, the instinct of the time. I was going to say, I mean, to pick up on Justin's <coughs> point, I think. Um, I think a lot of the ways in which divine right monarchy um, manifests itself is can be seen in more cultural, sort of symbolic ways. I mean, Macbeth is a very good example. Um, particularly one way of looking at Macbeth is to look at the relationship between a divinely ordained monarch, such as James conceives himself to be, the monarch who's watching the play, and the use of the sisters and the witches. I mean, if James, as he very prominently uh, does, regards himself as the Lord's anointed on earth, then he's going to be the biggest enemy that the devil can have, either in England or Scotland. And James himself takes very seriously his responsibility as a divinely ordained monarch to eliminate those elements within society, i.e. witches, who represent the diabolic ele element. So actually that scene where Macbeth goes to go and seek the witches' super or the sisters' supernatural powers to see ahead and have their, their, their sense of prophecy would have been deeply shocking to a monarch like James who writes on demonology, who takes his own um, responsibility for eliminating witchcraft very seriously. I mean, James himself has presided over witchcraft trials in Scotland as an attempt to eliminate those agents of the devil. I mean, very interesting about Macbeth as well is that you know, Shakespeare does always provide alternative, more rational explanations for some of the more um, unintelligible of the witch's prophecy, things like the camouflaged army that marches to Dunsinane or Macbeth's very unusual, Macduff's unusual caesarean birth. And I think the audience um, would have been 
just as obliged to adjudicate between the supernatural and the rational. But it is all an indication of the way in which the divine right of kings is reinforced um, in these other spheres. One of the problems is those n- normal Whig narratives about the execution of Charles I. Or it's, it's some sort of strategic political battle between king and parliament. I think to capture the true horror of that moment, mm. and you know, in, in contemporary terms, it's equivalent to the planes going into Twin Towers. You know, it fractured all of the cultural certainties of that, that period around Europe. If, if we believe and live in a society where everything is ordained, every hierarchy, ev- every part of social structure, every bit of life <coughs> within the family, within the church, is, is given by God, any deviation from that mm. is blasphemy. Now, Charles I himself, you know, not an odd man, I suspect, a very odd man, who wanted to, to use his majesty and his, his sacral um, authority, but unfortunately didn't actually like most of his, his people, um, F- finds himself manoeuvred into a position where he has to claim this anointed um, quality. I mean, if I give you one perhaps trivial example, the, the kings are therapeutic. They're anointed by God. They can cure. They can do miracles. And the, the, the great miracle in the Stuart period is the royal touch, um, scrofula, sort of s- version of tuberculosis, very unpleasant. Um, kings traditionally, it, it, way back into the medieval period, could cure by touching. Charles I thought this was wonderful. Um, it represented his, his divine authority. But he didn't actually like doing it because you had to touch infected, grubby people. Um, so from the late 1620s, while proclaiming his divinity, he issued series after series of proclamations banning these events. Of course, once the civil conflict had broken out in the 1640s, all of his advisers say, you've got to touch as many people as possible. And we can see in those sort of encounters between divine monarch and ordinary suffering sort of citizen, the power of this, this theory, I think, the power of that instinct. And the de- Sorry, and you want to say something? I, I was going to, 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 to um, come in and say that, that, that I, I think that one of the things that is this um, destabilizing point that can be come out from from a slightly different way in English society that what happens I think is that people become convinced that Charles is fundamentally rather like Satan that he who was God's first lieutenant in heaven and became the greatest traitor is in effect now similar to the monarch of England, that Charles is satanic in this way, that he who should have been rightly ruling in God's authority has become a traitor to God. And that then sparks off a a wave of what should be done that ultimately leads to his execution. But to, uh, that's, that's a point well made, but just to move across the cloud, to take on, to keep with Justin's point about the massive fracture, mm-hmm. and it's, I mean, one of the m- most difficult things in history is just remembering, or trying to get a grip on, remembering it's not the end of that, getting a grip on how big things were then, because the past, what does it matter, as it were, as much as toothache yesterday morning. But it was, he became... Charles, the execution, this is the end of the king, the end of a structure that had been going for, as far as most people were concerned, forever and ever and ever, not only in all of it immediately started a great cult of Charles as a saint and martyr mm-hmm. in this Protestant society, run by Cromwell, everything driven out, and we have Icon mm-hmm. Basilica, which uh, which uh, you'll tell us about and tell us how p- yeah, important it was. I think there's a, a big swing away from what Tom was saying. I mean, suddenly Charles moves from being sort of Satan personified to uh, immediately acquiring the saintly state the image of a martyr within a week um, a volume of his meditations known as Icon Basilica is published with a very dramatic frontispiece which shows a kneeling Charles lit by divine rays with a crown of thorns very much an imitation of Christ and a lot of those parallels between Christ's crucifixion and um, Charles's regicide are exploited and by authors. And these are his sayings and uh, his, his meditations, meditations in, 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 yes, um, so. and, and sort of prayers and reflections. Enormously. It's an enormous bestseller yeah. and a lot of more courageous writers in the 1650s start exploiting those parallels. I mean, both Christ and Charles had been God's representatives on earth. Both had been deemed to be above human censure. Both had been deemed um, you know, never to be able to kind of suffer in this way, and yet both had suffered at the hands of false witnesses. They'd both been put to death in very public manners. And actually, you could even begin to abbreviate Charles, as was often done in early modern type typography, with CH semicolon, and that could also stand for Christ at the same time. Um, and ironically, or, or interest, or sorry, poignantly, um, the New Testament lesson for the 30th of January, the date that Charles had actually been executed, was 27th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, which discusses Christ's trial and crucifixion. 
Mm. And uh, once the restoration um, occurs in 1660, uh, the 30th of January becomes a fast day in the Book of Common Prayer until 1859. Actually, even in the Alternative Service Book of 1980, Charles is reintroduced on the minor festivals. Um, I mean, there's obviously no way of having a canonization process in the Anglican Church, but that's about as close as you can get to list somebody.